Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Progressive Bitcoiner. I'm your host, Trey Walsh, and I'm joined today by Scott Santens, who is a leader in UBI, Universal Basic Income. That's right. We talked about Universal Basic Income on a Bitcoin show, and I was honored to have Margo Paez as my co-host for this episode. How's it going, Margo? We just got done with the recording, just got done talking to Scott. How was that? That was that was obviously an incredible conversation. <laughs> Uh, it was amazing. Uh, it's no secret. I retweet Scott a lot. I like the work that he's done on UBI. So this was, this definitely was a fangirl moment for me. So uh, I hope it wasn't like too obvious, but definitely was really, really so cool to meet him and ask him questions. And, and also, uh, I just want to say that we've confirmed that there is more than one fuck you money in the world. And then if you want to find out more, you should listen to the whole episode and find out what that is. We, we unpack a lot in this episode. So definitely be sure to listen to this full episode uh, and repeat it as well. There was a lot in here that, that Scott talked about and, and mentioned and just echo everything that, that Margo said. And one thing to note too, for people listening, I posted this on social media, but Margo's going to be joining me on a few episodes here and there. A particular topics, ones that are feel very much so like this as a co-host to jump into the ring. And, and Margo, I'm super thrilled for it. Um, Margo's a lot smarter than me. So there's that as well coming on and, and listening to her uh, talk about this. Um, just listening to you in this episode, Margo, with some of the questions you asked were, were really, really great. So I'm really excited to do that more with you this year um, in your super busy schedule and, and squeeze that in where we can. Uh, so this was definitely fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And before we get into the actual episode, I just want to say the one thing that I regret is that I didn't ask him if he was a fan of David Graeber because there was so many oh. moments where I was like, oh, I could tie in a, a David Graeber idea right now. And I never did. That is going to be my biggest regret for the rest of my life. Yeah, I bet he is. I find it hard to believe. Like, like Scott's a... Scott's a cool dude. He's got some like, just definitely resistance activism. He was down with the fuck you money stuff. Uh, yeah, I think I think there's a lot there. Um, I, I think that that he is for sure. Um, and we're for folks listening, we're going to do more conversations with Scott. I think there was just so much we went for, I guess, about an hour 45 with this episode. There's so much more we want to do spaces to have it be interactive in different live forms for for you folks to engage with Scott directly and kind of ask questions in live formats. Um, which Scott is totally game for. And, and Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you know, means the world to have these conversations and, and do this. Um, before we get to the episode, I'll mention, check out our show notes sponsors. As always, we've got SAS Mining for renewable Bitcoin mining, get $50 off each and every miner. We've got Bitbox for 5% off hardware wallets uh, with Bitbox, which is really, really awesome. And then check out Zeus as well, the best experience in Lightning, and you can get 5% off LSP fees um, using promo code TPB and the access code with Zeus. Um, we've got a Substack as well for you to check out in the show notes. And we're constantly thinking through what different materials to put through the Substack. So if you have any thoughts on that, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. You can hit me up in our Telegram group, which we have that'll be in the show notes as well. And if you have any thoughts, I'm sure there are a lot of thoughts on this episode. Uh, you know, keep, keep it civil. But if you have any thoughts on that, you can reach out to Margo or I. I'm sure Margo would love to hear from you as well, but you can always reach out to me at hello at progressivebitcoiner.com. Hi, Scott, and welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner. How are you? Good, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, chat with you today. Absolutely. Uh, and, and for those those listening, you'll already have heard in our intro, but Margo is here uh, as co-host for this episode as well. So welcome, Margo. Happy to have you here. And Scott, really just excited, as I was saying, for this conversation and to talk all things universal basic income, something that I and probably most people heard about around Andrew Yang's campaign. I think that was probably the the height of its popularity. And from uh, his perspective, it seems you were pretty uh, enlightening on that on that process. For but for for those that don't know about you, I think at this point a lot of people will have heard what UBI is. Maybe they think they know what it is or isn't. Uh, UBI, universal basic income. I know you mentioned unconditional basic income as well. Uh, but for you, uh, I'd love for, to hear a little bit about your your background uh, and what brought you into this this work and this space. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess before we continue at all, I just want to define basic income for everybody so that 
you know what it is and really what we're <laughs> about to talk about. Uh, so a basic income is a periodic cash payment unconditionally delivered to all without on an individual basis without means, test, or work requirement. Meaning that so in order to some, for something to qualify as a basic income, it needs to be cash, it needs to be unconditional, as in no work requirements, it needs to be universal, as in not means tested, goes to rich and poor. Uh, it needs to be individually provided. So it means every member of a household, not just like the head of the household. And it uh, it needs to be frequent, regularly provided. So that could be uh, monthly, typically, um, weekly, quarterly, annually. Um, these still all count as, as basic income or unconditional basic income or universal basic income or UBI. That's, uh, they're all they're referring to the same concept. So when, uh, how I got into the concept, uh, this is back in 2013. And uh, this was actually uh, prior to uh, the kind of the breaking open of the discussion about the future of work. Um, this was like before the Oxford, Oxford report, uh, talking about how 47% of jobs could be automated within the next 10 years, or 20 years, sorry. And uh, this was, uh, so when I got into it, it was actually still through the automation argument, but no one was really talking about it. So it was actually a discussion that hit the front page of Reddit. And it was all about how quickly technology was advancing and no one was talking about it. So there was just a really interesting uh, discussion thread. And I, I had thought that I was keeping up on technology because I like to follow technology. And there was stuff in there that I didn't realize was going so quickly either. And uh, that really just got me thinking about, yeah, what happens in the, the future of work? Uh, I was already, you know, influenced by, by Star Trek and, you know, wanting this future to be, you know, a lot better. And um, that was my version of better is like Star Trek. <laughs> so really, I was always open to how do we get there? Like, what is the realistic path from where we are now to a future like Star Trek? instead of, say, a future like The Hunger Games or Mad Max. And so getting into basic income as being a possible pathway um, is, is what got me into it. And then it was just fascinating to learn about uh, just the history of it and how we did experiments about this back in the 70s and how you know Nixon proposed a version of this. Um, and it almost uh, passed Congress. It passed the House twice, never passed the Senate. But we almost had a version of this uh, called the Family Assistance Plan in the 1970s. We did a bunch of pilots around the country. Um, Canada tested this back in the 70s, too. Um, I was fascinated to learn about the history and also all the pilots since then. Uh, as someone who's very like empirically driven, uh, I really care about science and scientific evidence. Uh, it was just fascinating to learn about, you know, what happens when you provide people money without conditions, and especially when you provide it universally in like what's called saturation sites, where entire communities get this instead of only like the poorest members of the communities. Uh, it was all fascinating to me. That, that, that's really cool, um, and, and I think too, you know, something that's going to be in the show notes that I just encourage people to already think about exploring is is your website, the resources, the links, the different literature on this. There's a lot of people thinking about and talking about this. Um, but I, I think and hope one thing that folks can agree on, because as I mentioned, just before we got on, you know, we're a Bitcoin show, we're trying to fill a niche of talking to the left and progressives and just anyone who will, who will listen uh, about about Bitcoin and about the possible good that it can do in the world. Um, but we care about a lot of these things about marginalized communities about the fact that of what happens when automation comes and is here, regardless of that timetable, what happens in all of these different environments. So I think the common ethos, uh, it's obviously very popular. There's a lot of data that shows that UBI is very, very popular in many different iterations. So I think everyone can understand and agree that the wealth disparities, the need for things getting more expensive and how to afford life in general for a lot of people, that's an issue. And I think where people might disagree or talk more uh, or interesting conversations happen is about how do we do that? How do we provide for that? How do people do that for themselves, communities, governments, and all of this fun intersection. So for me, these conversations are, are really fun and enjoyable. I know some people listening or even talking about these things get heated with it. But for me, it's like we're all trying to solve these problems that I hope everyone would see there, there's a problem with affordability with, with all of these things. Um, so, so for you, before we jump too far into 
Was there a, a certain moment, I know you said you're interested in, in technology, automotion, were there other things that really drew you to UBI or seeing it as, wow, this could be a really effective tool for addressing some of these bad things in life and some of the affordability crisis and just people paying for their everyday needs. Uh, what were some other things that drove you to it? Yeah, so it was learning about the evidence from the pilots that that really got me into this. Um, as an example of some of this, so learning about the um, the the fully universal pilots that were in Namibia and India. And those weren't in the 70s. Those were more the beginning of uh, the century. Uh, it was more like around 2010 um, when these pilots happened. And um, like learning about like how, how much of an impact it had on entrepreneurship. Uh, like in Namibia, entrepreneurship increased uh, 301%. And in India, the uh, the villages provided basic income had uh, three times the entrepreneurship rates as the villages that didn't get a basic income. Um, as an, an example, like an anecdote that that backs up uh, or illustrates this this uh, result was um, in the Namibia pilot when um, a woman used the very first payment actually to go out. She already had an idea of what she wanted to do. Uh, the payment essentially functioned as startup capital. Uh, she was able to go out and buy uh, flour and yeast, like ingredients, to start baking. She created like a like a like a makeshift kind of oven that she could use to bake in, and she started making these these little loaves of bread and uh, selling them to um, the people in her village. And so this was uh, around a thousand people uh, was in this village, and she ended up becoming like the biggest success story of that pilot uh, as this like aspiring entrepreneur. And I, I like to point out this story uh, because it really helps illustrate like the difference between it and really everything else. Like when it comes to say some kind of welfare assistance or, or loans even or something. So uh, the, the big, the big difference is that first of all, it functioned as as capital, just like a loan would. So, uh, you know, people can really, you know, maybe understand that. Uh, but one difference is that it re it reduces risk. So you know that if this fails, then you're going to have that that floor to stand on. Like you're not going to go back down to zero dollars a month if your business fails. You'll go back to whatever the basic income is. And so that reduced insecurity, this reduced concern of fear of, fear of failure. Um, I think leads to greater, uh, greater startup rates. Uh, but then the big thing is that whereas a loan could have could have still bought the flour and the yeast and you know the oven and stuff, and if she wasn't afraid, even if hitting zero, she like she just a reduced. Uh, she's just like a riskier kind of personality. Uh, then she would still have done that. Uh, but the basic income meant that her entire village was full of customers. So this is full of people that had money to actually buy her goods. And if she had gotten this in a vacuum where, you know, she just got a startup loan, would she have succeeded in, in a village full of people that couldn't buy her stuff? Well, arguably, she likely could have failed, or at least she would have done a lot worse. But because everyone in the village had basic income too, then they were all able to buy her stuff and they loved her baked goods. And that ended up leading to her income from her business being, I think it was, uh, uh, it was three or four times the amount of the basic income. So that's the money that she earned from her business on top of her UBI. And I, I think that helps illustrate just, you know, how much of a difference this can make to actually make sure that the people um, can be more entrepreneurial and that, you know, in economies that are that are focused on, you know, small businesses, uh, consumer based economy, uh, it really makes a difference for customers to actually be able to spend money. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, and, and Scott, too, this is um, me and usually this is a, a solo hosted show. So, so Margo, if anything, you know, co comes up, uh, feel free to jump in here as well. But Part of my approach, like, Scott, I know you've done these conversations so many different times. So if you feel like there's one extra point you want to make about UBI, because I really want people to get a good understanding of, of what it is. We'll tackle some of the misconceptions in this episode. There's no way we're going to get to absolutely everything <laughs> in this, you know, a little over an hour. 
conversations and want people to read and, and learn more about it. But I have a few questions on my end that I'll kind of ask that that jump out to me. Um, and, and one of the the first that comes to mind, I think people are like, okay, you know, we want to uh, assist people who need it. We want to make sure that people have their basic needs met, especially in somewhere like the United States. People shouldn't be in, in poverty. There shouldn't be the homeless crisis that we're dealing with. All of these things, right? But some other folks might say, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot, uh, you know, why the universal aspect? Um, you know, why is Jeff Bezos getting, uh, you know, universal basic income as well, or a thousand dollar check, or, you know, you put the the amount on there? Um, why the need for the universal aspect in your mind of this type of program and approach? Yeah, so uh, it, this also answers like a, a, your earlier question too, is it's part of what made me... Um, come to believe this was so important, uh, was learning more about the existing system. Like, how is it that we currently going up, go about uh, assistance? And of course, it's it's conditional and, and means-tested uh, welfare. So I really have to draw the distinction between welfare and basic income. A lot of people hear about, about basic income and think, oh, that's just like welfare for everybody, or it's just like more welfare, where I, I think is actually quite different. Um, because basic income is universal non-conditional. So when it comes to traditional welfare benefits, um, what usually happens is, let's say, you want to make sure that only those in need get this assistance. So then you have some kind of test. You say, okay, um, if the poverty line is $12,000 per year, then we want to make sure that we only get this some kind of assistance to those who are earning less than $12,000 a year. So that sounds like on its face, like a good idea. Like you, you just want to make sure that it goes to people in need. Uh, but there are a couple outcomes from that. Um, one of them is actually something that conservatives tend to understand um, pretty well, which is that there's a disincentive effect from welfare. So if, if you only get something, if you have an income under $12,000 per year, then you're essentially encouraged to keep your income below $12,000 a year in order to keep getting it. And as soon as you get it, and unless the what you, you know, unless a job offers you a sufficiently large amount of money, then you can actually be worse off or even only slightly better off um, by accepting some lower paying job or a part time job or something. Um, so there's a disincentivizing aspect to any kind of means testing. Um, another thing that happens is by drawing the line, and this is something that I think um, progressives and stuff don't appreciate as much as I feel that they should, is that by drawing that line, then you create a test, which a lot of people fail, even the ones that you want to pass it, which is why if you look at like the actual details of the existing programs, you'll find that often many of them actually only reach around a quarter of the people that actually qualify for the programs. Uh, and some of them are even ridiculously smaller than that. Our best program uh, coverage-wise is SNAP, otherwise known as food stamps. And that's about, uh, it's about two out of three that qualify for SNAP get it. One out of three don't. And then you look at stuff like um, TANF is about one out of five. Uh, uh, housing assistance is about one out of four. Um, you know, a lot of these times, the people that we want to get something because they, we feel that they're the most needy don't get it because we wanted to make sure they do get it. Like it's a real, it's just a backwards kind of impact from insisting on some kind of test. So that's why universality is important. Universality means that you make sure and include everybody. Like if you look at something like disability, that too, it's about one out of five people with a disability um, end up getting some kind of disability income. And so four out of five people with a disability aren't. So therefore, if you make sure that, that there's a UBI, then that means five out of five people with a disability have at least the UBI. And then you can still have some kind of disability program on top of it. But then the one out of five who get it um, means that the four out of five aren't like screwed, like totally to the point of getting nothing. They always have at least something. And then, of course, because it's universal, that means you don't lose it with work, which means that work is not disincentivized like welfare is. You know, so then if you have 
if you have $1,000 per month in, in, in welfare and a job offers you $1,000 per month, then uh, it's, it's, it's possible that you would then end up with $1,000 per month. So you, you get nothing more for that new job, which is equivalent to either a 100% tax rate or working for free. And why would you do that? Whereas with UBI, if you have $1,000 per month of UBI and a job offers you $1,000 per month, you've just doubled your income. And that's where the incentive comes from work, which is also why if you look at all the pilots, all the evidence shows that work um, does not decrease significantly at all with basic income and actually often increases. Like with the entrepreneurship impacts, you see just a lot of people starting up their businesses. That's one of the main impacts is that even if people work less in wage labor, um, a lot of the impact goes uh, to um, self-employment and even doing something like unpaid care work or school. Where, so that's an investment in future work or, or actually focusing on unpaid work that isn't recognized as work. So this sounds like a libertarian dream up to the point where many libertarians, except for some who have actually read Hayek, would say, oh, this is, you know, this is just like free money and it's like government interference. It, it seems counterintuitive to what a lot of libertarians think of in terms of their freedom from the government. But some of the things that you've highlighted are like, you know, improving entrepreneurship, which is, you know, something that a lot of libertarians value very much, this idea of being an entrepreneur. And it uh, sounds like it benefits uh, the economic system overall, and it does so in a way where you're not telling anybody what they should be doing with their money, which is also a very nice libertarian idea as well. Uh, so where is the problem then where, you know, there is, seems to be an opposition to UBI? A lot of the messages that Trey got when he posted that this interview was going to happen we're very negative and very skeptical of UBI, especially around inflation. And I think it would be great if you could you could touch on that because that is, I, I think, something of particular interest to the type of listeners that that we have. Even though that this is largely a progressive audience, there is a big overlap in terms of economic values. They tend to be more libertarian, so. Inflation is a really big concern. So how does this work? Because it sounds like you get lots of great benefits that everyone would appreciate, libertarians as well. But, you know, are, what, where are the, the risks? Like, you know, is this going to cause inflation? How do you pay for it? Uh, is it going to save, does it, is it less costly than having welfare alone? Would you, would it, replace welfare? Obviously, a lot of questions that I just asked you, but start with, yeah. you know, how do you pay for this? Does it cause inflation? Let's start. Yeah. No, so the, the, the three primary um, oppositional arguments to basic income are that people will stop working, that it will cause inflation, and that we can't afford it. Like Those are definitely the three major things. Um, so to get into one of the, the, the many things you just brought up, um, inflation being something that is a, a primary fear. And uh, that was already a primary fear prior to the pandemic. And it's only gotten worse since then, um, regardless of all the pilots and, um, you know, regardless of anything, because people are still experiencing currently um, higher inflation. And so then the last thing they want is, is more inflation. Um, even if they were to get uh, some amount of money that would even be greater than the amount of inflation. Like, it's just this concern. And so uh, to get into the inflation stuff, okay. So first of all, uh, one thing I like to point out is if you look around the world, uh, at, is, any, is there any place that has a basic income? Um, and the answer is, yeah, Alaska does. Like Alaska is the, the best example of something that qualifies as a basic income. It meets all five characteristics of a basic income. It's uh, once a year, it's their annual dividend payment. It's usually around one to $2,000 per year and it's per person in the household. So if it's $2,000 and there's a household of five, 
then that's ten thousand dollars that year. You know, it's it it can be a good chunk of a, a good chunk of change. And if you were to be concerned about inflation, then that hypothesis says, okay, so this dividend payment started in 1982. And if you were to look at the rate of inflation in Alaska um, before and after 1982, if basic income causes inflation, then the rate of inflation in Alaska should have increased after 1982. Like that's the hypothesis that you can create. And if you look at that, you'd see that the rate of inflation post-1982 actually slowed compared to the rest of the U.S. Um, it did not increase. And every year when the dividend sales go out, businesses actually drop their prices. They have um, you know, dividend sales and they're all trying to compete over people to spend at their business instead of some other business. You know, it's just like with Christmas where you think you know, everyone is, wants to spend money and you can think that, well, businesses should actually raise their prices because everyone has money to spend and they're willing to spend it now. No, they actually lower their prices because of competition. So one element of this, of course, is that competitive aspect. You know, competition does matter. And um, if you raise your prices because people have more money, then your competitor could lower their prices or not raise their prices and then could actually put you out of business um, because you decided to do that. Now, when it comes to the pandemic, there's a lot of bad lessons that people got from the pandemic and what we witnessed. Like there's a lot of uh, belief out there that um, the inflation that we saw when it peaked at 9% and uh, even the inflation we're seeing now is somehow the result of the like stimulus payments that we did. And uh, the stimulus payments that we did, uh, we did about $800 billion worth. And the total amount of government spending that we did to stimulate the economy to prevent deflation uh, during the pandemic shutdowns and everything uh, was over $6 trillion. So we're talking about um, a small slice of everything that we did was the stimulus payments and then people blame the stimulus payments. Um, and of course, you know, during this time too, the inflation wasn't because people had more money. Like an element of that was that. But for the most part, we were looking at a pandemic, which actually restrained supply, the ability to meet supply due to global supply chain entanglements and um, the shutdowns reducing, you know, the, just the general capacity to meet demand for goods and services. And because of the shutdowns too, there was more demand for services than, or for, more demand for goods and services during that time. All of that meant that demand exceeded supply because supply dropped. And that's really what caused most of the inflation. Um, at the time, the Fed did an analysis to figure out, you know, what their estimate of what the stimulus was, um, the impact on inflation. It was a third of the nine points. So we're looking at around three points of the nine points at max was attributable to stimulus. And so two thirds of it was attributable to just the impact of the global pandemic, which is why you saw inflation all over the world. And it didn't matter how much stimulus that some country did or didn't do. Um, it was just a matter of the fact that we were in a global pandemic. And it was because of our strong stimulus response during the pandemic that we actually just rocketed back out of this shutdown. And our our economy is like the 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 best in the world right now as far as you know economic growth um this soon out of this massive you know historic um uh pandemic and an impact on the the global supply chain so that's just one thing to keep in mind is is um is just what we did during the pandemic and what we saw afterwards then i would also add that uh people look at what we did during the pandemic and they like mistake at all as being somehow base income related, where um, there's actually some great distinctions to draw. Like when we boosted unemployment, that was a boost of $600 per week or about $2,400 per month of unemployment. And unemployment is literally paying people not to work. If you get a job, you lose all of that. So if you're getting, and that was in a, the 2400 was a boost to your already employment. So if you were getting $3,000 of unemployment income, 
and you had a job offer for $1,500 a month, it made no sense at all to take that. But if we had done like monthly stimulus checks, then you wouldn't have lost the income as a result of taking the job and actually would have boosted everyone who was still working. So, you know, we looked at, um, you know, who were the important workers who were doing the most important work of all and they couldn't take it off. They should have gotten a boost. Um, but instead, people were rightful to complain that you had this big unemployment boost. People who weren't working got a bunch of money. But then if you were still, you know, considered to be necessary work, maybe you were working a job that was getting $2,000 per month. And here you are looking at people unemployed doing better than you now. Where, where was their boost? Their only boost was the stimulus checks. So I just think it would have made more sense to do the stimulus payments. And what we didn't do, uh, and one of the reasons why we saw this inflation too, was the result of not doing something like a windfall tax or you know ex excess inflation tax or excess profits tax. And that's the kind of tax that isn't about you know raising revenue. Um, it's about just discouraging companies from seeking excess profits. You know, a bunch of what we saw with sellers inflation, which is that businesses in this environment of inflation due to lower supply and therefore costlier components, um, they raised their, their prices way beyond what they actually needed to do. Because why not? You know, if prices are going up anyways, because they need to, might as well capture a much larger percentage of your profits by by raising your uh, by raising your prices even more. We could have discouraged that. We just didn't do that. And I encouraged. I wanted that to happen during the during the pandemic. And looking ahead and seeing, we should do that, but we didn't. So there are tools that we could have done to reduce inflation, and we didn't do that. This episode of the Progressive Bitcoiner is brought to you by Zeus. Zeus is a self-custodial Bitcoin wallet for Android and iOS. The app features a built-in Lightning node that allows you to take full control of how you make payments on-chain and on Lightning. You can easily onboard to the Lightning network and let Zeus's Lightning service provider, Olympus, do all the heavy lifting for you. Or you can get more hands-on and curate your own Lightning channels with whoever you transact with most. Zeus has best-in-class privacy and allows you to have great peace of mind when sending and receiving Lightning payments. Not only does the Zeus team not want to know how you're using your money, but they're building things in a way that they can't know. There's also a first of its kind lightning address that will allow you to receive payments 24 seven to your mobile wallet self custodially. This is a great solution for a range of people. For those who just wanna have the technical ability to set up their own infrastructure, to the nomads and dissidents that need to accept donations on the move. Other lightning wallets don't give the users this level of control. In fact, many of them operate more like bank accounts that can be revoked and ultimately lead to you losing your money. With Zeus, you're in full control of your private keys and therefore can start to take full control of your financial destiny. Save 5% on LSP fees using code TPB in the access code under LSP settings. To learn more and to learn where to download, head to ZeusLN.com. You were talking about this, the unemployment payments, disincentivizing people going to work. So would a UBI be better than a guaranteed jobs program? Because for example, you know, a lot of people who are progressive on and or on the economic side of things, talk a lot about a guaranteed jobs program. You know, it was a, uh, it was a uh, I think Minsky's idea originally, and it's been picked up by a lot of people in modern monetary theory. But would would a UBI be better than a, than a guaranteed jobs program? And are the, would there be a similarity of benefits or cons or you know, do you, is that something you could speak on? Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, of, of, I would say yeah. Of course, I believe that that UBI is is superior to um, a federal jobs guarantee. Uh, but I'm also you know I'm not against doing any kind of jobs program. You know, like it, it does make sense for um, the government to invest in jobs that are work that's not getting done. Uh, that wouldn't otherwise get done. That's important. Um, you know, there's this, there's there's certain failures in the market um, that doesn't um, you know achieve the work that that needs to be done. So there is an argument for that. Uh, but what I don't like is seeing it as some kind of replacement. You know, doing like let's or alternative. So let's do federal jobs instead of a basic income. I I totally disagree with that uh, because. A uh, basic income is like a very vital foundation. Like you want to make sure that people have at least some amount of access 
unconditionally to resources. So again, they have that security, they have the ability to spend, they have the ability to make their own jobs, they have their ability to actually volunteer and do unpaid work, uh, that you can actually make that choice. And also that it gives you that power to say no, which I think that libertarians should be very supportive of. And it's actually one of uh, Friedrich Hayek's arguments for basic income um, was because of this power to say no. Um, if, if you don't have that power, then you can be taken advantage of. Um, you will be coerced into work and wages that you wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, it's a lot of the reason why poverty wages even exist because you're, uh, it makes more sense to accept a poverty wage than it does to have nothing at all. So a lot of work gets done in, this is even, um, uh, either harmful work or unnecessary work, um, or for abusive employers. Um, it's due to this lack of power that people have because they don't have a basic income. And that's true even with the federal jobs guarantee. Uh, federal jobs guarantee, people will say that it helps to some degree because you would actually be able to say to an employer, I don't have to say yes to you. Uh, I can say yes to the um, you know government instead to work some government job. Uh, but you still only have that as your option. You know, it's this lack of ability to say no between two options uh, isn't freedom. It's just like another option. <laughs> you have to be able to say no. Yeah, absolutely. And this is such a, you touch on such great points. And, and Trey, you know. We could end the show right now yeah, and be like, be <laughs> they've heard more about UBI than I think what they think. <laughs> Honestly. Yes, but, but, okay. I don't know, <laughs> Trey, if you, if you get this kind of pushback ever on Twitter, on Bitcoin Twitter. Probably. But, <laughs> but you know, a lot, of, what I find really fascin fascinating about a lot of people who claim to be libertarians is that they overlook the authoritarian coercive aspect of the employer employee relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's really interesting because there, it's not just a, you, you know, true freedom is not just freedom from coercion from your government. It ought to be freedom from coercion from all forms yeah. of oppression, right? And, yeah. and in the job, in the workplace, and in the labor market, if you're going to be on an equal footing with the employer, you ought to have a way to say no and to exercise your right to, to escape that type of coercion from being forced to take a job or to take hours with wages that are not suitable for you. And what you're saying, Scott, to me is like liberty maximization on the across the board uh, to create an even playing field within all, all markets in a market system. So yeah. Yeah, you can't yeah. refuse domination without an empowered status. And that's what basic income provides. Uh, I think a lot of conservatives understand the importance of an empowered status through like the Second Amendment. You know, they'll say, oh, well, you know, if I don't have a gun, then someone else can take advantage of me. They can take from me. They can steal from me. They can hurt me. Um, but if I have a gun, then that's like the great equalizer. And so if you have a gun, then you can make sure that no one dominates you. Mm -hmm. um, basic income is like an economic kind of gun, you know, where you have this and you can say, no, I refuse your domination. I, I absolutely refuse. I can do this myself. You know, I can, um, I can survive off my own work. Um, and then this also, this actually leads into, um, why uh, this is like another libertarian argument is that, um, is that we kind of removed the ability for people to live just like off the land, you know, doing their own kind of work. Um, we, what we did is if you go back to like the enclosures, um, you know, you, you look at the, the common land, you know, even back in the day in the U S uh, when everyone was like moving West, uh, you could actually, uh, with homestead grants, you could actually just claim land as yours and it was just free and you could actually just live off the land. Um, that was an option. Uh, now there is no such thing. Like you can't just claim land as yours. It, it belongs to someone else. And in this, in this kind of situation, it's the owners of the land that have that power of you. 
they can say, no, like you, if you work for me, then I will give you access to what the land provides. And is that freedom? No. Like it was, so as soon as we, as soon as we enclosed the land and prevented people from actually um, sustaining themselves off of it with the fruit of their own, you know, enjoying the fruits of their own labor and making it so that it was the choice between the, um, the non-owners um, being dominated by the owners, um, the owners owed to everyone else the ability to actually still live, which is, um, you know, Thomas Paine's argument. This is, uh, uh, he claimed that, that when it comes to, um, you know, ownership of stuff, then there is an element of that stuff that is natural. You know, this is, it's a natural resource. Um, and so if you, you know, dig like, uh, or dig minerals out of the ground and you create it into something like you should own, um, the work that you put into it. You know, like if you transform a metal and you forge it into something and, and, and sell it, um, you know, you should certainly benefit from that. Uh, but who created the actual minerals? N nobody did, or you could say God did. Uh, but nobody actually created that. So who 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 should benefit from that? Uh, as soon as someone digs it out of the ground, that's now that now means that no one else can use that. It's it's gone from them. So there should be some form of con compensation. Uh, the way Thomas Paine framed it was some kind of ground rent. Is that everyone owes to the public at large for taking natural resources and land? And I believe that's a strong libertarian argument for basic income is this understanding that you can you can benefit from all kinds of things that, that of the work that you do and stuff that you create but you never own like 100 percent of something because some percentage of that was is purely natural and that who should own what is natural i think all of us collectively should should own that and that's actually the way the alaska dividend worked is they recognize that when it comes to the oil in alaska everyone in Alaska owns that oil collectively. And so who should benefit from that? Should it like, should a drilling company be able to come in, drill the oil out of the ground and then just profit off of that? Or should the people who own the land and the oil in it, should they get something from it? And the way Alaska does it is that 25% of the revenue goes into this fund. Uh, and it's seen as, as, um, you know, a, a collectively owned uh, permanent fund that everyone receives a dividend from. There's so many good points between what you what you both said. Uh, you know, I want to go back to something Margot said as well with these power dynamics, especially with employers. I think what you hear from a lot of folks in the U.S. say maybe on the right that would be opposed to this in in theory or some of the things we're we're talking about. You hear a lot vote with your feet, right? Especially when it comes to okay, you live in a state that you don't like their restrictive laws on some sort of health care or abortion rights or, or something else or Second Amendment rights, whatever it is that's important to someone to say, vote with your feet and move. I mean, it doesn't take more than two seconds to think that's really hard for most people. That's really hard for me. That's really especially hard for people in poverty. So I think a lot of the criticism, Margo, to your point is from people, for lack of better terms, in a privileged position, maybe regardless of their philosophical or, or political leanings. So even when talking about, oh, with an employer, Sometimes it's really hard. Um, I, I work in nonprofits myself. There's a lot of immigrant coworkers that I work with and other folks that have, have quite frankly said in different work environments, like it's, it's really hard. I have, I have kids. I have, there's, a, there's a power dynamic. I can't, really, I can't really mess with that. I can't vote with my feet to just get another job overnight like, like some other people might be able to in certain contexts. So I think a lot of folks would say, oh yeah, we have, we have rights and, and, and freedom. Just vote with your feet. Just get a different job. Those are hypothetical things. But in reality, uh, I, I agree. And I think this, gosh, I've never heard that quote before around the Second Amendment and UBI that's super interesting and would, would frustrate people in all the right ways um, from any side with that, which is incredible. Uh, so those are some of the things I was thinking in terms of power dynamics. It's, it's a point of privilege. It, it, as far as voting with your feet goes, there's another element to this that, that I like to point out, which is, um, as you said, it assumes everyone can vote with their feet. And the way, what I want to talk about is, is in terms of, of businesses. And so, you know, the way that uh, the markets are, are supposed to work and that, uh, that we the, imagine they were the reason that, that markets 
do work is that you essentially money acts as like a vote. And that, you know, if, a, if one business is doing something that you like, then you go there, you vote for that business with your dollars and that business can continue to do business. And then a, a business that doesn't have any people voting for it, that goes out of business and then a new business pops up and then people get to vote. Do you like that business or don't you? So that's the way that, that markets work. But of course, the kind of underlying mechanism is this vote which is the dollar. And so we don't actually have a system where everybody can vote, but we have a system where some people can vote and they can vote like a lot. Like they have like all kinds, they have billions of ballots that they can use to vote. And um, it's, it's very disproportionate. So you've got a, a, a large percentage of the population um, just doesn't have the ability to vote at all in markets, uh, especially if they're on welfare, receiving benefits in kind, they're not even uh, they're not even signaling markets at all. So markets essentially can't tell the difference between zero and null. Um, what that means is is a business doesn't know if customers don't like it or if customers don't have the money to spend money there. UBI means that suddenly everybody has a minimum amount of votes to vote in markets. They can actually, you know, every single person, if you get $1,000 per month, they can actually vote on the stuff that they feel is important. And then the result of that is you have an economy that actually makes sure that everyone's demands are met because it sees their demand. Right now, we've got a market that only sees the demand of mostly those with the most money. And that's why you get a lot of distortions where, you know, you've got uh, luxury malls and, you know, m malls that we used to know are, are dying. And you've got like luxury uh, vacation experiences and, you know, where, where people who go to uh, Disneyland now and Disney World and stuff are, are spending, you know, it's really expensive to go there now. When you do it, you, they have these all sorts of, like you can stay in a, in a in a princess castle or or something like some premium experience and you pay extra for rides and you pay for a VIP person to lead you around like you have all these these the stuff in the market that's more that's catered towards those expressing their demand and part of that problem is the fact that so many people are not able to express their demand so you'd actually improve the market like you you want a higher functioning market that actually meets everybody's needs and to make sure you do that, you have to make sure everyone can express their needs through money. Yeah. So this reminds me of something that I learned at reading um, an ecological economics book, which was that the markets are very efficient in certain ways. Like they're very, they can be very efficient at telling you what is there, what is available, but they are not very efficient at distributing what is available. And so what I think what you're what I'm hearing is that this solves a problem of markets in the sense that it gives it it makes markets better at delivering the resources uh be you know in a in a fairer way I would say. I almost don't want to say fair but you know it, in a more efficient way of allocating those resources rather than only towards those who have successfully found a way to accumulate the you know we're talking about dollars here so accumulating dollars right if you if you eat you give everyone a you know a minimum of to exercise that vote of demand we can solve one of these problems in markets and more effectively distribute the resources so to me it sounds like this solves a really big problem that has been identified around markets. And yeah. then another thing that I think is really cool about what you were saying before about this idea around the, who owns the natural resources, which uh, you know I think is it's not it's 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 like it is a libertarian idea, but I think it's much more of like a traditional libertarian idea in, in in that sense of like what is property and and who does this property belong to and and 
And what I think of immediately is like, oh, this, well, this, if we were to design a UBI around this idea of this kind of like resource rent or however you, you called it, right? Uh, that will, that for one thing, I think solves any concerns around having to print money to distribute the UBI or to create the UBI because uh, it would be tied to your basic physical resources and what is available and and the needs of people. Like there is a drive to pull resources because there's a demand from them. There's people, people are being born every day, right? So you have growth in population, you have a growth in resource use. And then if you are taking a certain percentage of that, like you described in Alaska, 25%, well, 25% of that is going to scale as resource use scales, as people being born scale. And I think that that solves a lot of concerns around how can we afford a UBI? How do we you know, avoid inflating the money supply in order to provide money for everyone at this basic level. And I think that's really great because then I think about climate change <laughs> and then I think, well, we should just tax 100% of profits from all fossil fuel companies and then use that for a UBI because they have truly benefited in, in ways uh, using, uh, using those natural resources like uh, fossil fuels in a way that has been extremely detrimental to society and to the environment. And this is one way to pay back what is owed to everyone for the damage that has been done. So I'm just like thinking of all the ways that this ties together and, and I just get more excited <laughs> every time I think about a UBI. Yeah, I would, I would add uh, to that like, so if we're talking about like, uh, like inflation and, and, and printing money, um, and, and these concerns when it comes to UBI, um, when it comes to inflation, uh, you know, that the government creates the currency, what it doesn't tax back is what's left out there as the money supply for businesses in, in the private sector to use. And if so, if the government is continually um, spending more than it's taxing, then the money supply is growing and, and you know, that's inflationary. People, I think, in general, understand that. Um, so but what, what they might not understand is that taxes as a tool then are a deflationary tool. Like you want to use taxes in order to to shrink the available money supply. And um, instead of thinking of it as like, a source of revenue like it's it's kind of it's not the it's not the order of events that people traditionally think where they think that at the national level you tax and then you spend it's that you spend and then you tax so uh taxes should should be seen as this this mechanism of pulling money out of the money supply in which case the best way to pull money out of the money supply is to do it in ways where you're taxing stuff that we don't want or we're taxing in a way that somehow, um, you know, doesn't hurt productivity and can even, you know, improve it. So when it comes to um, optimal taxes, you know, I don't think income tax is an optimal tax because again, you're you're taxing employment, and we want employment. Or you know, I guess if you want more automation, then you know, maybe that. Um, but most people tend to agree that that income is not like the kind of the best tax when you look at other things. Uh, but, when it, but when you do start to see this as a, as a deflationary mechanism, as a tool, then, you're, you, then you get to think, okay, what are the best taxes? Uh, Milton Friedman, uh, another person besides Hayek who supported basic income, uh, he, he believed that land value tax was the best tax. And I agree. Like I, I think a land value tax would be an incredible way to pull money out of the money supply because the way that that the the way that functions is it it focuses only on the land value itself not what's built on it um, by by taxing only the land value then you actually encourage people to develop that land and you don't discourage those who do build you know so if you have like a an, an empty like vacant lot next to a skyscraper and you know the the person's holding the vacant lot because they want to sell it for like big bucks. Um, how much 
they get this huge windfall when they sell that. And what did they do for it? Nothing. They built nothing. But the person next to them who owned that lot, they built a skyscraper. And, you know, everything around that is what created the land value that this one person benefited from. So yeah, it just makes all the sense in the world to tax that. That's taxing economic rent. It's entirely unproductive. So that's something that I think makes a lot of sense to do. When it comes to the environment, I also think carbon taxes make a lot of sense to do. Uh, because again, you you want to discourage people from having a large carbon footprint, and it would be hugely impactful uh, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to tax that. The issue is that you know usually so many people push against carbon taxes is because yeah, it would raise prices of stuff. You know, if you if you make this gasoline more expensive, then that means that also besides your it being more expensive to get to and from work. But now transport's more expensive, which means everything transported goes up in price, which means foods go up, which means all these other um, goods go up and services go up. So it causes higher prices. But if you have a base income component that's paired with the carbon tax, then that means that usually, depending on design, about the bottom two thirds actually end up receiving more in the base income than they pay in this carbon tax. And again, it depends on design. Uh, but only those at the top, those are the ones who have the largest carbon footprints are the ones who are paying more in taxes than they're getting back in basic income. That, I think, makes all the sense in the world. That's like a three birds and one stone kind of, of tax and, and basic income strategy. And uh, I guess I want to mention, too, that when it comes to cost, just overall cost of basic income, um, I really like people to, to question what is the cost of not having a basic income? You know, is it free? No. Uh, when you look at like the cost of child poverty, that's been calculated as, as we're spending a trillion dollars per year, over a trillion dollars per year on the downstream cost of child poverty, which means that, you know, a children, uh, children growing up in poverty, they're more likely to end up in jail. Um, they're more likely to um, have poorer health outcomes. And they're... Um, they're more likely to earn less throughout their life, you know, so they're in, in less productive jobs or not able to find work, that kind of thing. Um, that's a huge cost to us to spend over a trillion dollars per year on child poverty and to think that it's somehow free. And so then when we look at like a, a program like the monthly child tax credit that cut child, um, child poverty in about half, um, like instantaneously, and on average, that was about $430 per month to the families receiving it. And it depended on the child's age. Um, we didn't do that. Part of the argument was, oh, $100 billion per year is too much. Like that's too much money. And so it was just, if you look at only the $100 billion per year, then you think that could be expensive, but you're ignoring the trillion dollars a year we're already spending. So that should always be part of any calculation of can we afford a basic income is wondering what are the full costs of poverty? What are the full costs of actual chronic mass insecurity and instability? And what are the costs of extreme inequality? We know that all of these things uh, in their separate ways lead to many expensive outcomes. Uh, so the, we're, therefore, we should see UBI as being this investment up front to avoid those larger downstream costs. Would, do you think you would need a, a windfall tax as well with that in, in the sense of like, suddenly you give everyone in the US, for example, is getting a UBI. And would, would that, would, could there potentially be an effect where companies could raise prices because there are now more people exercising their vote to demand for a product. And uh, w is there anything that stops them from artificially raising prices just, and rather than bringing in more supply to meet that demand? Is, because I, I think like, if you have a company, like a big company like Amazon that owns, you know, grocery stores and it's kind of a monopoly in some, in a lot of ways with, uh, with the marketplace and that they run. And I think now they're trying to set up healthcare systems. Like, 
what stops a monopolist corporation from just raising prices under that scenario to absorb that that new money or you know that distribution of money effectively um because you, you know the example you gave in alaska was the competition for please come and spend your money in my in my store drives down the prices but we have so many situations where we have monopolistic or oligopic marketplaces like i'm thinking like even healthcare health insurance would there need to be an additional mechanism in place to prevent that from happening at scale yeah so that's, that's definitely the more uh, that's like the the progressive concern against basic income post pandemic i would say is this uh, you know they looked at sellers inflation and now it's like, well, apparently, you know, businesses have all the ability in the world to just increase prices to whatever and absorb everything, which is why like post pandemic, um, there's a lot more uh, people supporting like universal basic services instead of universal basic income, because they've basically given up on markets. They're like, no, markets are, are apparently broken. And the only way to do this is through government services. And that's that or some kind of price controls. Um, so in the response to that, I'd say, first of all, there's, again, kind of a misunderstanding or of basic income um, in regards to, like, yes, it's true that everyone universally receives whatever the basic income is. And let's say it's $1,200 per month is the, the basic income. Uh, that does not mean that everyone's disposable income has increased by $1,200 per month. Um, that depends on the taxes that have been paired with it, the welfare reforms that have been paired with it, uh, the tax expenditure reforms. Um, it means that there's uh, some amount of, of net increase or decrease after taxes that has to be taken into account. Um, so in a case of like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and you know the other billionaires, like yes, they'll get the twelve hundred dollars per month, uh, but their taxes would have gone up much further than twelve hundred dollars per month. They will not see a disposable income boost. So then, if you look at you know there's 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 depending on design, there's some you know person um, that is receiving just as much in UBI as they're receiving or as they're paying in additional new taxes. And um, so let's say, let's say that person is around um, $120,000 or something, where they are uh, receiving $1,200 per month in UBI, but their new taxes are, uh, uh, are $1,200 per month. So they are zero, that they don't uh, benefit from basic income uh, financially, um, and they don't uh, pay higher taxes um, either, uh, on net instead, they're like the, you know, they experience the, the greater security of the basic income. They don't see a boost. And so then go below that. So everyone that below that net neutral point are some are receiving some amount of disposable income boost. And for the middle class, um, that won't be $1,200 per month. It'll be, you know, something like say, Six hundred dollars per month, or five hundred dollars per some uh, on net, and with only those the you know, earning zero, getting the full amount of net benefit. Um, so already it, that the way that 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 net amount of money that people are boosted by, it's depending on design, usually around like a third of the total. Um, so whereas people would think, oh this design means that, you know, will be $3 trillion per year by multiplying the number of people by the amount of basic income. And then they think that's highly inflationary and that's too expensive. Um, whereas the actual net boost they received is something more like a trillion dollars per year, which is um, less costly and less inflationary than $3 trillion per year. So that's just one aspect of it is that it's not as, in, it's not as inflationary as people think 
based on the boost that people get. And it's also business owners don't know that. Landlords don't know that. They don't know what someone's net boost is. They don't even know. It could be zero. It could be the person that didn't benefit at all. It could be someone that actually is paying more in taxes now than they're receiving. They have a, a net uh, disposable income loss plus basic income because they're earning like, you know, quarter million dollars per year or something. Um, so that's like, that's an important aspect to understand. Uh, but then as far as like additional tools, we, we definitely want to, to think about, um, you know, how to uh, avoid price increases. How do we um, encourage like, or invest in greater supply? In, in which case, um, you know, besides having like antitrust enforcement, uh, and try to like break up these 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 monopoly powers and you know reduce them. Um, also focus on like when it comes to housing uh, is an example. Uh, land value tax that already is very helpful with increasing the housing supply and uh, you know reducing rent pressures, uh, but also stuff like YIMBY laws. You know, so um, just making sure that say restrictions that uh, say you can't build anything here but single family homes, um, if you get rid of restrictions like that and enable people to buy, to, to build multifamily homes, then the supply of homes goes up and therefore that's deflationary to the, you know, or counter inflationary to the cost of, of rent. And so therefore just like reforming those kinds of laws could be seen as as both helping to afford a basic income, uh, but also helping to fight uh, inflationary impact. And uh, I, since because because so many people are worried about rent, I'd also just add that there's a couple other things to consider when it comes to to basic income and just like rent prices. Is that we do know that people who provided basic income actually increase their home ownership rates. You know, like a lot of people rent because they can't afford to buy. And so if people have a basic income floor and that uh, disposable income boost, then a lot of people will use that to become homeowners. And then if you have more homeowners, you have less fewer, you have fewer people looking to be renters, which means that pushes down our rental prices. And then in, in areas too, where cost of living is expensive and rents are way up, um, basic income enables people to actually move uh, as Trey, you mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of people can't afford to move. Well, basic income enables people to move. And so uh, people can actually uh, move from high expensive areas to low, to, to, to lesser expensive areas. And by doing so, they reduce the pressure for rents in those costly areas. And that's something to consider as well. It's just when it comes to rent, you've got these counter inflationary forces. Um, that are that are acting um, by essentially like competing by increasing competition among landlords and uh, decreasing the the demand for actual rentals over um, over homes to own. Hi everyone, hope you're enjoying the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitbox. Now, Bitbox is a hardware wallet that's open source, incredibly secure and easy to use, and it's what I'm using to safely secure my Bitcoin in cold storage. Now, I know self-custodying Bitcoin can really be intimidating, but Bitbox is designed for ease of use without compromising on security. It's USB-C compatible and allows you to easily back up and restore your private keys with a micro SD card, which is really cool. Now you can purchase the Bitbox using the promo code TPB at the link found in the show notes for 5% off your purchase. And I really want to thank Bitbox for their support of the podcast. And I'm really excited about this new partnership. All right, I'll let you get back to the episode now. It, it's so funny. I'm just taking a step back from this conversation and folks and uh, folks probably will need to replay this a few times. There's just so much information in this in this episode already. But I guess one one question I'd say is, where do we feel like, because I feel like, UBI was having a big national moment with Andrew Yang's campaign. Um, you know, the right, right. I, maybe you can largely ballpark it like 2017 to 2020 or something. And there's many pilots, of course, and it's still kind of in the national consciousness, but, but not quite as much. Um, why isn't it? It's extremely popular with voters, right? A lot of things we're talking about and just these concepts and ideas, it was and always has been extremely popular with voters. But a lot of the things you, that you've said already, you're, you're threading between political parties, between ideologies, even with, uh, 
to keep mentioning, I mean, I, I love Andrew Yang, but mentioning Andrew Yang, obviously there's so many other people that have been working on this, but just popularizing it even to a, another huge level was a fairly different candidate or different concept. So even the, the concept of UBI, as we're talking, it doesn't quite have a home in, in this kind of political narrative that we've been talking about, which is really cool, which is why I'm interested in talking about it on this show of progressive and Bitcoiner and all of these things that have so many boxes and labels that don't quite fit. So why do you feel like it's been having a tougher time really gripping policymakers and, and actually becoming larger? And one other thing I'd add too is that I think what UBI does in the conversations we're having is just admitting and acknowledging, just like you were saying, like we're not settlers anymore. We're not able to just claim land. Like we are addressing problems in the world as they are today, not some sort of idyllic situation or, or some other. This is trying to resolve problems today. I would argue that might be the reason UBI should exist, right? It's not the other way around where UBI is creating a problem and addressing it. It's like, okay, because of these things, it could be a possible solution. So what are your thoughts on why it hasn't, you know, caught on more at, at, to, to reach the popularity that it is in polls to be a national standard, so to speak? Yeah, definitely uh, uh, multiple answers for this particular question. Um, I, I love to say basic income is not left or right, it's forward. And Andrew Yang even then like made that like part of his campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact, and this is one of the things that really drew it to me in, in the first place, drew me to it in the first place, was that it is entirely cross-partisan. Like I love the fact mm -hmm. that that there's no uh, one party that somehow owns this, like no one philosophy that owns this. I love the fact that there are, uh, you know, capitalists and socialists who are for it and also capitalists and socialists who are against it. Like there's just, it, it's, it's an idea that just doesn't have this kind of like partisan aspect to it. And I think that's part of the problem in our day and age because our day and age is hyper-partisan. Mm. So, um, you know, a lot of people support or oppose something because members of their party, are mostly like party leaders, party elites, um, these political elites, like if they support something, then your tribe, you know, whatever it is, comes to support it because they do. And, you know, you won't say that, you know, like no one will say, I believe something because, you know, Trump supports it or whatever. Um, but of course, we know that in, in that case and in, in, you know, the case on the left too, that's entirely true. Like all that matters mm -hmm. really is for like one or two key people to support or oppose something. And as long as it's partisan uh, and then you have the other party being against it because they're for it, then it's these partisan ideas um, that are very, very successful um, in this day and age, which, uh, you know, has become more of the, you know, culture war kind of stuff, unfortunately, where, you know, we're not even talking about like kind of real policy stuff. Now we're just talking about this like culture war stuff where my tribe is for or against something and the other tribe is for or against something because they're for or against something. Um, it's just like a big mess. and. Until we, until we get back to some, you know, more of a, a rational, logical, um, less hyperpartisan time, something that's more moderate, then um, maybe it's going to be very extremely difficult uh, because it's really hard to build up support for something in a cross-partisan way. It, as, as soon as one, as soon as one party, if it was to adopt it as like a, a platform, as like mm -hmm. a key platform. In our in our day and age, the other party would immediately come out against it, and then everyone in their party, even if they like the idea or are interested, you would know that you couldn't say that you're for it because then you would be signaling that you're not in that tribe, and so that's what people don't want to do is kicked out of their tribe, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's a big it's a big challenge, a big and, yeah. and that's just a challenge in general. You know, it's not an only basic incomes challenge. Mm -hmm. It's it's you yeah. know just it's a huge challenge of our time. But I would also add that besides this, um, what I consider to be a good aspect of it being entirely cross-partisan, there's just miscommunications and, and misinformation out there about it. Like one of the most 
annoying things to me most recently is uh, how like coming out of the pandemic, you've got like the conspiracy crowd who have decided that basic income is like some kind of control mechanism tool, um, you know, that was created by elites and pushed by like the World Economic Forum or something. Mm -hmm. And that the entire point of it is to like control people. And they'll even say stuff like, you know, a, a basic income will have conditions. And it, that's so frustrating to me because, I mean, definitionally speaking, a basic income can't have conditions. So mm -hmm. you, you, it's like they're afraid of welfare and welfare has all sorts of conditions. And we know that. Um, but like the entire point of a basic income is to remove the conditions. So if it has conditions, then we haven't won basic income and we should still keep fighting for basic income. Um, you know, it's just if you're concerned about that, it's just all the more reason to be for actual basic income, not for fake basic income. Yeah, I, I think what's what's interesting, I, I think I've kind of felt this in different ways, but I hope people pick up on this common thread. And you know, there's a lot of folks, especially in the Bitcoin community, that even see the title of this episode or whatever, and they're not gonna listen and they're gonna they're gonna trash on it, right? Which I'm sure you've experienced all the time with people just not not taking time on any topic to to listen. There's some that have might have turned it off after the first 10 minutes, you know, whatever. For those that have stuck stuck through this, the one thing that's really cool, and I'm, I, I think strategically Margo was bringing up these points, which I appreciate, is again, crossing through ideologies and seeing universal basic income. I think people can understand how it might be empowering, but understanding how it, it is this kind of also freedom and in a way can be a libertarian tool. And again, not trying to apply labels to it, but that's a really cool way for some folks to do some mental exercises on UBI that even just throughout this episode and listening to you both talk about it helps me reflect on it more in that way. Like it gives people more agency to choose, to say no, to do these opportunities that are deeply liberating. And someone who's historically from, from the left, it's very frustrating that, you know, the right or whoever would just capture that word or capture freedom on certain policies. When everything you're saying, just it being unconditional and, and, I've worked in nonprofits my entire life and, and understand what these programs and how inaccessible to people they are, how restricting they are, right? Okay, well, once you make this income, you're out of this housing development, those kinds of things. This is updating. This is updating what, what society needs. Um, and I think it's really important for, for people to hear and at least think about, you know, there, I'm sure there's many other things we would agree or disagree on and, th and things like that. But a lot of these premises, it, you're right, it, it's it's forward, it's different. Um, but it's very interesting. You're saying because it's not partisan, we've had trouble picking it up. And that's just, gosh, that's just to the times, man. It's, it's very, <laughs> very frustrating. And, and yeah. I'd say some people listening now, you know, they're like, okay, you guys are a Bitcoin show. You haven't said Bitcoin once, whatever. And I'd say for, for, for you, Scott, and for those listening, you know, the types of Bitcoiners that I like to talk with, like Margo, you know, to, focusing on climate change and, and mining and all these solutions, what we talk about in this show is solutions over ideology. And I think UBI is one thing there. And a lot of folks that are coming into to Bitcoin, a lot of us got into it thinking of Occupy, thinking of solutions, thinking things are broken. What, what would it be like to have a money that is, is separate from the state in this way or, 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 or money that is censorship resistant for activists that's cross-border? It's finding a solution. It's not like my speculation of Bitcoin was a crypto bro obsessed with the thing. And there are many people that, that are, are that way. For me, it was like it, it posed a solution to something. I came into it as thinking about human rights, thinking about, you know, my nonprofit background and things like that. And so I think for a lot of people as well, I think there are some similar, there's so many misconceptions about, about Bitcoin. And then there's honestly good conversation debate to have on it as well. Same with UBI. There's so many misconceptions on UBI, but there are good points to be raised as well, which... Uh, I think, you know, Margot kind of kicked us off with a lot of those good ones, but um, this is really refreshing. I, I got to say, Scott, and frustrating at the same time, right? Because <laughs> we're like, ah, we can make more progress on this, but how do we, how do we get there? That's like the big question. Yeah. I, I just, uh, there's a couple of things I want to make sure and include, I guess, in this, uh, as well as just some more pieces of evidence for people to, to mm -hmm. understand, because we are talking about a concept and this concept has been tested a lot. Yeah. And I know most people are, are worried about you know, people not working. Um, whereas again, you know, a lot of the evidence just points in the, the opposite direction. Um, like is uh, one of the first of the new US pilots, the Stockton pilot, 
that was a smaller pilot was lasted for about two years. And uh, the result is that people who received the basic income of $500 per month uh, found full-time employment at twice the rate of those who didn't. And you see that kind of impact quite a lot even in these other pilots going on around the U.S. Um, and I want to stress that one of the reasons why people see that is because you have to have a starting point. You've, you know, it takes money to make money. People know that phrase. Uh, people say, pick, your up by, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. But that also implies that people are wearing boots. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, they have to have boots right. in the first place. Yeah. That's so basic income is money to buy boots. It's starting money. It's like how you look at a game of Monopoly. The first thing that everyone gets is money in order to play the game. And then you mm -hmm. keep getting more money as you go around go each time. You can't play the game otherwise. So just this on a conceptual level, people need to understand um, that this, you know, even pull back from this being like a governmental thing. It doesn't have to be. You know, this can be a private sector thing. This can be through crypto. It can be something that nonprofits engage in. It can be something built into various, um, you know, systems and monetary systems and whatever. Uh, but it's just the, the idea that each member of a community should start with something instead of nothing it seems like so simple, but it's also like like revolutionary or evolutionary in how different it is. Like it's hard for people to even accept that that's actually a good idea. Like, oh, you can't just give people something from nothing, they'll do nothing. Whereas instead what you see is that if people uh, are, are trusted, like if there's trust in the system and you actually trust people with some amount of resources, they actually use it very wisely and very creatively and they end up doing far better than they would have if they had had nothing. You know, you, you've, you've got to give people money for bootstraps if you believe in the bootstraps myth or theory, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then some other, some other, uh, some other evidence I think people should consider is that like in the Namibia UBI pilot, overall crime reduced by over 42%. And so just consider that. And that wasn't the only, in, in the Canadian pilot, it went down 15% overall. Uh, violent crime went down 37%. And just imagine, you know, w how much money are we spending on crime um, not having a basic income? And what are the implications? Like, you can be as rich as you want, but if you get stabbed out in the streets, then, you know, Congrats on living in or, or in a in a place where you could get all sorts of wealth and and power, but then you still end up getting stabbed because people are doing so poorly that mm -hmm. um, you know crime are a result of this. So it's not to say that all crime is a result of poverty and insecurity and inequality, but it's definitely some portion of crime. It's some significant portion of crime is because people don't have a basic income. And same thing with healthcare. Like uh, one of the impacts from the, the Canadian pilot in the 70s was reduced hospitalization rates of 8.5%. We know from the Stockton pilot that, uh, that mental health was improved uh, akin to antidepressants. Like you know over and over again from pilot after pilot that physical and mental health improve. So how much money are we spending in our healthcare system? And we're spending trillions of dollars a year on healthcare. We're treating sickness. And, you know, this is a, a pound of cure versus an ounce of prevention kind of thing. Like if we can prevent um, so much of this need for healthcare because people are healthier, uh, because they had a basic income and security, then again, that's so much less money that we would be spending. And you have to connect those two to the cost concerns and the inflation concerns. Like it's inflationary to spend all this money on healthcare and crime. Uh, and if we reduce that by, by moving money up front and then afterwards, like you can, those amounts can still be somewhat similar even, and you wouldn't see an inflationary impact because it's not more money over this course of like, you know, decades or, or, or longer. Instead, it's just upfront versus afterwards. And we would all be much happier if um, the amount of money, you know, being spent and, and utilized is actually um, uh, in an environment of healthier people and less crime than spending it on, on, on medical care and um, 
the prison system. Yeah, there's so many things in this conversation. You're just completely flipping it on its head, honestly. And I think you even, a lot of the questions that I had, obviously you've been doing this for a long time and I'm sure you're used to coming into rooms and rebutting uh, misconceptions about, about UBI, which is great. And I think you're really good at it. A lot of the questions that I had, you, you answered and flipped it on, it's on its head. And it doesn't mean there isn't nuance or, or disagreement there. But I, so I really hope that people listen and dig into that. And I'll mention this before I forget it. Margo, I'm curious if you thought about this. So it, I don't really care what, from a governmental standpoint, it's kind of funny to think that way, what Bitcoin is classified as, but a lot of folks would classify it as a commodity. So when you're talking about the Alaska UBI project and oil dividends, I then imagine Bitcoin as the commodity of which dividends could be, could be paid in, um, which could be really, really cool. Because I, I know you mentioned too, I think there's all sorts of ways to you know, hypothetically think about UBI and sources of funding and things like that. And, and Bitcoin being this deflationary tool and being this asset that, asset that goes up in price and having dividends from that is kind of one cool way to think about it from, from um, um, Bitcoin. But I mean, we'll see if we even have any Bitcoiners still listening. Well, <laughs> trade, but actually, and so this is something that kind of already happens in Bitcoin and at least within, I know of one, company that funds their uh, build out of solar, I think in South Africa. Mm. And oh man, I'm completely forgetting the name of the company. The company is based in South Africa. We'll look it up and, and I'll throw so it in the show notes. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's Sun something, I think. And anyway, so they crowdsource investment to build out solar and there's different projects like could be solar for a school or a church, whatever. And so each of us could you know, invest a, a micro amount into the solar and maybe like I own one of the solar panels and I do it in Bitcoin. And then what happens is they pay out dividends back to you on your investment. And so what they found, they did a little study just internally, and they found that people were just leaving the, the dividends, you know, in the on with the company. And then they would come back and they would see that the price of Bitcoin had gone up. So they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. So I made some money. But instead of them just, you know, taking the the earnings that they got, they actually were reinvesting it and buying more solar and building out more solar. So, so there's already some, you know, existing examples, at least one example where this kind of dividend idea with Bitcoin is already happening and actually making you know, the build out of, of more solar in South Africa happen, at least on a small scale. So yeah, Shrey, this is, of course, something that is totally possible. And uh, it would be really interesting to see. I've always imagined that, you know, communities could mine a little Bitcoin and take that and share that that wealth uh, amongst themselves and then take the waste heat and then build out their greenhouse with that. Uh, like, I know somebody who's doing that uh, with an indigenous group up in Canada, actually. So yeah, I think that would be very interesting. There's always, there's also nuances there <laughs> with how that would work in terms of uh, the, the payout from mining and how you're, you're sourcing your electricity. But yeah, that's something that could happen at least at small scales. Yeah. yeah and I'll also add it's, uh, I'm so sorry, it's Sun Exchange is the, the company. I just looked it up. So okay. Sun Exchange. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 fun to actually think about, you know, the interactions between Bitcoin and, and basic income. And you know, we haven't really gotten into that at all, but we certainly can. And I think uh, what you were just talking about is a you know, good place to start. But just, a, you know, it, it, let's just start what, in, instead of Bitcoin, just thinking about like solar panels or something. And so, you know, if a government builds a bunch of solar panels or whatever, then and, and, and uh, wind turbines, let's say too, um, you know, that's who, who should, who should benefit from, you know, the, the, the energy and, you know, income derived from these things. Um, you can think of like, you know, who does the wind belong to? Well, you know, belongs to no one or everybody. Who does the sun belong to? Well, it belongs to no one or anybody, everybody. Um, and and so it can kind of like wrap your head around the fact that say like uh like solar power and wind power should pay some kind of amount to everybody because of the fact that 
you know, it's getting a resource that that nobody or everybody owns. Uh, then it comes to Bitcoin. You know, there's there's uh, you know, Bitcoin mining means that if you're a miner, then you, you get this you know, some amount of Bitcoin in return for um, you know being the the winner of um, you know that that particular cryptocurrency or, or cryptographic puzzle contest. You know, um, but then when uh, let's say if a government were to buy, you know, a bunch of, of Bitcoin miners for like a farm, Bitcoin farm of some kind, you know, who should, who should benefit from that? Um, it's, uh, uh, if the, if the, if the government is benefiting, you know, from a bunch of these mining fees, um, you know, I would argue that, that everyone should at least get some portion of that, uh, especially if the energy, you know, that's actually going into, uh, enabling the miners to mine is actually again somehow related to wind turbines or or the sun or something like that. Um, so there's there's definitely y- you could look at at some amount of 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 large governmental kind of bitcoining thing as as um, needing to pay some amount of dividends, and then that goes back into um, just in general, if you're looking at government spending, you know, what percentage of government spending actually should go to everybody in the form of a basic income? Um, again, that, that, that then makes you think, all right, well, you know, what is it, uh, that's the commons? Um, what is it that, um, you know, that we can classify as, as all deserving a, a percentage of some kind? What have we inherited, um, from the past? You know, we're all standing on each other's shoulders. so. Um, you know, do we even all like deserve um, the the fruits of the efforts of people from, you know, centuries ago? And then that brings us to like, you know, when it comes to AI, um, you know, who should benefit from AI? Is it only the people who were, you know, born recently, built off the technology that existed all prior to that, improved it a little bit more to the point where they developed like hyper um, uh, effective AI? And become trillionaires, like, and then everybody or lots of people uh, either lose their jobs or they see um, lower wages uh, as a result of of the impact of of robots on on work. Like, who who should benefit from that? Especially when we are the ones who actually created the capital, the data capital that trained the AI. You know, none of this would be possible without everything that all of us collectively did to create this ginormous pile of data that in that made AI possible. So it just in general, it's interesting to think, you know, what percentage of everything that we're doing, AI, the economy as a whole, um, uh, natural resources, like all this stuff, what actually should go to everybody, some percentage of it, as Thomas Paine said, and I agree with should go to everybody. And I hope that that people start thinking in those terms and thinking, you know, if wh- why am I afraid of AI when that can do like so much for everybody? There, it's just we have to make sure that th- that AI and robots work for all of us. The only way to like make that literally true is through universal basic income. That's robots working for every single one of us, and you know something like Bitcoin too that could be made to work for every single one of us. We could all benefit. And if they did, maybe that would mean more countries actually investing in Bitcoin because it would be more popular with people because they would all benefit. But if only some people benefit, why would you do this? Why would people be excited about it? Scott, stop. You're you're sounding like a Bitcoin. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, Scott Scott is... Bitcoin is the global asset, world, uh, you know, global reserve asset. This is what I'm hearing from Scott right now. (laughs) Scott's recommending the U.S. invest 5% of the federal budget into a wind (laughs) farm for Bitcoin money. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'll jump on that Um, really quick with what, what Scott said. I think that is one of the... The things that that myself, I, I think I'm curious your thoughts on this. For someone to come to UBI, I think there might be one stipulation. And I think that stipulation would be what you just said, that we believe that we should live in a world where everyone is kind of a part of creating this world that has been throughout the variety of ways that are typically have been taken for granted. 
and everyone deserves a fair contribution of that, whatever that looks like. Because some people coming to the table or some folks in, in, in Bitcoin that I might disagree with on this point of think, well, they didn't do X, Y, Z, so they don't deserve X, Y, Z, right? And I can quote Marx and they'll dismiss me and, and all of this stuff, right? So I think that might be one condition to being open to this conversation is do we want or do we believe we should live in a world where that sort of system exists, whether you call it redistribution of some kind or whatever. I almost view it as kind of a fact of life at this point, as we were talking about. And that is one thing that Bitcoin in and of itself, I personally feel, doesn't necessarily do. People can hoard massive amounts of Bitcoin. People can be fabulously wealthy on Bitcoin. Now, governments and different people, the protocol is, is written, it, it's code, there's fixed supply, there's mining every 10 minutes, there's there's things that are neutral and permissionless about people's access to it. But people are going to have different varying levels of wealth with it. So then it's the philosophies and individual Bitcoiners of what they would like to do with that or how we would like to approach it. And that's what I'm interested in, in talking about because Bitcoin in and of itself has a lot of cool incentive properties for, for mining and all of these other stuff. But in and of itself, it doesn't fix wealth inequality. Uh, it, it doesn't yeah. do a lot of these things. But people who might believe in and have access to Bitcoin and all of these things might be interested in addressing wealth inequality through that. I and Margo are, are one of those, and there's many, many others. So I think there's a lot of cool things to do with it. But yeah, on the surface, it, it doesn't necessarily tackle that. But are people willing to say we should live in a world where some level of Gosh, even redistribution, I don't know why in my head right now, even I was saying it, I feel like it's such a dirty word or people just kind of misinterpret and things like that. But um, there's a better word, go for it. But I think you have to agree on that, perhaps. So I'm curious, Scott, Margaret, your thoughts. My, my, I will let Scott go. He's our <laughs> guest. He can go first. Yeah, it's it's funny that you that you uh, mention redistribution again, like you, it's definitely, it, it's like a bad word. You know, we've we've come to the point where you you just don't say redistribution. You know that people oppose that. And um, Alaska's dividend, um, a lot of Alaskans see this as a form of predistribution. Um, and mm. the way that they see that as predistribution is that because money goes directly from uh, the government to people, you know, it doesn't first go to politicians and to people. You know, it doesn't go to politicians for them to decide where it should go. Instead, it's, it's distributed directly to people. And then people get to spend it in, in ways that whatever they wish. Uh, and that's money that the government isn't deciding for them. Um, so I would, I, I would say that the redistribution is when it's like gone through the process of going through a politician. You know, it's, uh, like welfare is a form of redistribution because it's going through a politician and the politician sets up a bureaucracy and the bureaucracy says, this person deserves it, this person doesn't, this comes with these conditions, this is what you can't do with it, it all these restrictions. And and they know better than the rest of us because they're smart politicians and bureaucrats and, and they know what's better for us than we do. Mm -hmm. But if it goes directly to us and it goes around them, then that's predistribution. That's us saying, all right, that's the starting point. I get to decide what happens. The government doesn't get to decide. I get to decide what happens with this. And that's, that's where like this, this, this not only distributional change comes from, this is where like inequality can, can decrease because of this, uh, but also it's a, it's a power distributional change. Like this is, you know, power to the people. This is, again, it's a market votes, it's decision making, it's, um, again, it's the ability to say no to people and coercion. Um, that 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 new distribution of of money and then power and trust and all of these things that's very that's very powerful in a way that people enough people don't grasp yet about basic income. Yeah. Um, there's some fears, and I think there's people aren't connecting the fears to like the the potential. You know, they'll they worry that people. Um, We'll stop working. And I, I know that uh, like a common thing, and this is even in the 70s in the, when we almost had this under Nixon and it, uh, it never got through the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee was named Russell Long. He was the son of Huey Long. Uh, they're from uh, in Louisiana. Huey Long actually ran on a large basic income um, before he was assassinated. 
and uh, his son was ended up in the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, he was against it. And his response was, who will press my shirts? So his concern was that <laughs> people won't serve him. And also part of this is people won't serve him for cheap. You know, that's a lot of the concern comes from where, oh, we can't find any workers. Well, a lot of that is saying you can't find any workers at the price that you're offering. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what's, that's, and so that fear actually should, you know, people should see that fear and recognize, oh, they're afraid of that because of the power that it gives to people, because it means that they could demand higher wages, like because that, that, they would these these rich elites would have less power over the rest of us if we could just have this 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 um this uplifted uh position that enables us this power um and i i just hope people would ev eventually uh you know come to see that yeah that absolutely and i i want to add to this the you know, if you if you frame this really around uh, this idea that Scott has presented already, that who owns any of this at, at the fundamental, who owns the land really, who owns these natural resources? If it's uh, if it if it belongs to everyone, if fundamentally we all agree that the air, the sun, light, etc., doesn't really belong to any particular person, then it's not it's not a redistribution it's just correct allocation of the resources or the benefit of the resources and i think that's just like that's just a fundamental shift of how you view how society should operate and i think and that's probably a, a step that people have to take to to think about this in a different light and also i think for people who would be opposed to this because of fear of government coercion because ultimately the way that we've talked about this distribution is like, for example, in Alaska, if I understand, right, it's a, it's a dividend and it sounds like the government is managing us and then pays it out. You know, Bitcoin plays a great step here, can be potentially be a great step because Bitcoin is not owned, the, you know, the network is not owned by anyone. The protocol is not owned by anyone. Also, it's a shared resource. It's a commons. And there is no intermediary between you and and anybody else uh, in terms of sending money or you know receiving sending money so if you just had a, a system set up where you know let's say it's like an oil company in in Alaska that money gets put into a wallet on the bitcoin network and then it's just automatically through some contracts distributed into everybody's bitcoin wallet Right. That immediately eliminates any concerns around government interference at all. And it and it removes that necessary trust that you have to have that your government isn't going to one day say, actually, you know, what? I changed my mind. All this money is going to go to me. I'm the president. I'm taking over now. Thank you very much. This is going into my pocket now. Right. So I think that is something also interesting to consider in a way to fairly uh, distribute this while reducing the, you know, the trust element, which is that something like Bitcoin can, can serve a really important role there. And it's like, you know, Scott, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, but uh, the, some people like to think of Bitcoin as fuck you money. And so UBI in the same way is, is also that kind of money, I think. So no, absolutely. I think, I think that there's interesting overlaps here and the ways to make people com more comfortable around it. I, I, I think that there can be potentially some kind of convergence in the way that a trustless, permissionless network works for distributing that kind of money it, in the future. I, I think that would be very cool to see happen. And yeah, I think that like, you know, everything... If people who oppose these kinds of solutions, I think they don't realistically, they have like a, a, a fantasy idea of capitalism and markets and how they work and that markets solve everything. You just let them do their own thing. But in like the actual existing market system, we've seen where that has, where there are market failures, uh, whether it's because of, you know, a, a merger of, corporations and government and, you know, uh, 
the dilution of antitrust laws, whatever, you know, we see a lot of, of problems in our existing marketplace. And I think that having, if we, if we look at it very frankly, and we want to build a world that functions in a fair way for everyone, where we have resources being distributed to everyone who needs them, then I think we do have to look at something like a UBI as a potential solution because Bitcoin is, you know, one kind of one one tool in all of this, I, I think, but it's it doesn't solve every problem. We we have to have multiple tools, and I, I think UBI is just one of those uh, ideas that we should take more seriously. Yeah, yeah. I I would uh I would I would emphasize that you know basic income is a floor. It's a it's a foundation, and you know Bitcoin does not create a floor or a foundation. You can use Bitcoin to create a floor or a foundation, um, but it's not automatically there. You know, you, you, if, you, if you want everybody to use Bitcoin, then you actually have to make sure that everyone gets some amount of Bitcoin. And so there's this, there's this uh, you know, Bitcoin is, is a thing, but there has to be a mechanism and UBI is a mechanism. You know, it's it's a way of going about um, you know monetary distribution, and um, you know that in usually means cash, but it doesn't have to mean cash. It can mean any other kind of currency. Um, but the it's it's understanding that the characteristics of basic income are supremely important with the unconditionality, universality, individuality, and frequency. Like those things actually create all these um, you know, wonderful outcomes that differentiate it from everything that we've done before. You know, just everything, the way that we go about the existing system with conditions and means testing and household spending and, and, and not this regular thing you can count on, um, that leads to all these negative outcomes. Um, so if people recognize that you can have all these positive outcomes from these, these just making sure that you do it in a basic income way, then, um, then we'll get there. Um, I'd also just like to add, as we're as we're towards the end here, that um, I just want to mention some more. Um, you know, just like visualizing how the the good, the positive, how how different things can can be. Uh, a lot of this was that we've discussed is kind of like anti-negative um, instead of like really truly positive. And I so just want to end on that kind of note. Um, I guess I'll start with this by going back again to Milton Friedman, who again was pro basic income, um, to the fact that he actually uh, joined um, basic income Earth Network, Earth Network BN, the international organization, uh, before he died. Uh, a lot of people have no idea that he was so pro basic income that he was even a member of a basic income international organization. Um, but one of the things about Milton Friedman too is he actually argued for a voluntary military. You know, this was in the time, of course, we had like the draft, we had the Vietnam War. Um, this was, we had an involuntary military. And out of this, he wanted to stress that a voluntary military will be better. Like if you make sure that everyone in the military is someone who has chosen to be there and chooses to actually train and do this professionally, then you're going to have a better military than a, than a military force full of people that do not want to be there, have no interest in being there, and you know would potentially um, uh, you know do things or not do things that could lead to you know losses and lost wars and you know everything else. Um, and I think that we should look at the labor market in the same way, you know. And I'm, I'm sure that he saw that too where if you have a fully voluntary labor market, because everyone has fuck you money, as you said, because people can say no, then that means that you've got people choosing jobs because they actually want to do those jobs. Now, it, people then hear that and think, oh, that means people won't do jobs that people don't want to do. No, it just means that those jobs that people don't want to do will have to pay more. That's how you get someone to voluntarily choose to do a non-attractive job is because it pays enough. And that's the way supply and demand should work. Like it, the jobs that no one wants to do, those should be the ones to pay more. And the jobs that people love, well, you don't have to pay them as much because 
there's intrinsic motivation involved. People want to do them because they're meaningful, purposeful, and the basic income enables that boost so that they can still live, you know, a happy life uh, without getting paid some extravagant amount. But the important part is this voluntary aspect. Like uh, I wrote an article uh, called like the Monsters Inc. Argument for Basic Income where I explained, I got people to think, um, you know, what if, what if you uh, get to, uh, you know, choose between two chefs and one chef has spent uh, their entire life like trying to figure out the, the best food, like to make the best food possible. They, they want someone to eat their food and be like, that is the most miraculous food I've ever had in my life. That's amazing. That's their goal. It's their life goal is to make the best food. And then you have someone else with a gun to their head and just saying, you make this person a really good meal. Mm. <laughs> like who's going to make the better meal? It's, it's going to be the person that really chose to do that. And that just imagine how different the labor market is with that. Like imagine going to a restaurant where everyone actually wants to work at that restaurant. You know, they're there because the boss is great because the food is great. You know, they are happy to be there. They take pride in their work because they're voluntarily there. And imagine like, you know, just all these different jobs out there full of people that are, you know, just looking at the clock all the time and they don't give a shit about being at that job. They don't care about that. Um, and meanwhile, someone else is unemployed. They would love that job, but that job is being filled by someone who has no interest in it. So, Imagine how much of a better labor market that is when the people who don't want to be in the jobs that they don't care about are no longer in those jobs and instead they're in jobs that they do care about. And people are actually choosing to do stuff because they're either paid enough or because it's meaningful. That's a much higher functioning labor market. And we won't have that until we have a basic income. Well, Scott, there's still time between the next presidential election. So, you know, I think I think we got something here. You know, if you're interested, you know, maybe uh, pull Andrew back in, you know, things like that. Um, I mean, my point being, the, like you said, these are such popular takes. These are such um, interesting conversations and, and, and solutions, right? Because I think the alternative, from, from what I'm hearing quite a bit, I haven't seen a lot of other good solutions to a lot of the problems we're facing. And of course, there's nuance here. Of course, there's some experimentation. Of course, what would this look like on a scale of 370 million Americans? You know, things like that. Um, but I, I hope folks that listen to this conversation take something away. I hope, well, if they're not listening at this point, they already turned it off. But I hope folks continue to learn throughout or to listen throughout this entire conversation. Um, and Scott, I want to thank you for being so generous with your time. And agreeing to come on a, a Bitcoin podcast, you know, in the landscape of, uh, you know, everything with that, that word means. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you, Margo, for being here too. Um, this was so fun. But I, I want to, before we, we jump off, I, I want to make sure, Scott, if you have places to send folks, we'll put your website and everything in the show notes. But if you have anything in particular coming up, anything you want to um, talk to people about, book, podcast, website, um, definitely want to make sure people hear about that. Sure. Yeah. So people can go to my website, scottsantos.com. I've got an FAQ there. Um, if you're, if you have to be interested in, um, you know, my foundational work, that's it's a foundation.org. That's a nonprofit focused on um, basic income and storytelling of, of basic income. Uh, my book is Let There Be Money. Uh, you can find that on, on Amazon. On, on, you can find me on Twitter, and uh, I've actually got a very long pin thread there devoted to the evidence. So I always encourage people to go through that because uh, you can at least just learn all of the the pilot evidence that there is to um, to know to just learn more about this concept. And um, yeah, I just encourage people to to be curious, stay curious, and um, you know just look into this instead of just uh, uh, reflexing uh, against this based on you know, the members of your tribe and what uh, they may um, think are uh, in regards to even um, supporting or opposing basic income. But, you know, reachers this, look into it. Yeah, that's like everything we say about Bitcoin too. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> Margo, do you have anything else for Scott? And Scott, I, I am definitely gonna, gonna ping you again to do like a spaces or something like that. I think more interactive environments. I'd love for, for more people and different audiences that maybe know and trust us a little bit to hear some of your thoughts in different ways. I think that'd be really cool to explore um, in the future. But sure. Margo, do you have any other, any thoughts or I'm sure you have many thoughts still, but uh, 
closing remarks. We're out of time, so I don't want to take up any more of Scott's time. I just want to express my gratitude and thank him for coming on here. I've been a big follower, a fan for a number of years, and I went from thinking UBI was a good idea to a bad idea, and then way back to the UBI <laughs> great because of Scott. So really, really special to, to have him on the show. And, and yes, that really emphasize what, what, what Trey said, which is thank you for coming on a Bitcoin podcast. It's not, it, we don't usually get people saying yes who aren't part of the Bitcoin space. So there's really, really great that you kept, you have an open mind enough to to be here on the show because your message, your ideas, the stuff that you worked on is really important and it's really important to to reach people who are interested in Bitcoin and share your ideas with them as well. So thank you. And yeah. I hope Thanks, you'll Margo. be back again. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for inviting me to uh to to be with you today. And you know, I always love really getting into deep into this um so it, I, I enjoyed this myself and i hope everyone uh, listening um really got some interesting uh, uh and new new thoughts and, and ways of thinking about this that they never really considered before yeah i think they did i did certainly and i think margo might have might have too so um yeah thank you again so much scott appreciate it right yeah thanks trey thanks margo 